The article Environment Minister Catherine McKenna on Contradiction at Heart of Canada's Energy Policy, published by CBC, elucidates the concepts and issue at hand elaborated in The Good Anthropocene and Green Political Theory. Oil pipelines have been touted as nation building projects in Canada, a term that evokes bold feet of nation spanning infrastructure. But pipeline proposals to connect Alberta's oil sands with British Columbia coast or Atlantic Canada have also done much to tear the nation apart. The Kinder Morgan Trans Mountain Expansion Project pitted province against province, Canadians against Canadians. Minister of Environment and Climate Change says that Kinder Morgan Pipeline can be part of the transition from fossil fuels to low carbon economy. This article examines the relationship between energy policy and climate change policy in Canada. The article finds that Canadian climate change and energy policy have operated in parallel but contradictory directions. The resulting dichotomy helps to explain Canada's failure to achieve significant reductions in GHG emissions. There is a broad consensus in the country that climate change is real and that it's a problem and that government should do something about it. And the federal government has made commitments under the Paris Agreement on Climate Change to reduce its carbon emissions by 30% below its 2005 levels by 2030. The government is, however, well behind on meeting those targets to accord with the international commitments. Topical theme for our presentation is anthropocentrism and the environment. The Anthropocene or so-called age of humans, the new epoch of geological time in which human activity is considered such a powerful influence on environment, climate and ecology of the planet that it has left a long-term signature in the strata record. Canada's proposed carbon prices are an economic signal meant to reduce carbon emissions from producing and consuming fossil fuels. But this conflicts with the fossil fuel subsidies that create an incentive to produce and consume more fossil fuels and which increase carbon pollution. It is tough going green while pumping the black stuff. The Alberta government has also weakened environmental protection from oil impacts. Liabilities for the environmental damage from oil and gas and mining now totals $260 billion, according to the Alberta Energy Regulator. And yet, the government is approving new projects and allowing the size, volume and cost of tar sands tailing ponds to continue to increase. This raises the question, how might we explain the contradicting governmental actions in concerns to economic policies and the environment? Following Primo's line of thinking, the rise of awareness accountability for our ecological footprint is explained by warning signs of distress that nature has been demonstrating in the form of natural disasters and ecological catastrophes. According to the author, humans have for a long time misinterpreted and misused our relationship with nature. Instead of trying to master the bond that we have with our surrounding environment, we have been trying to master it through the use of science, technology, and rational forms of organizations. The idea of nature through the continuation of a pre-reflexive narrative of progress becomes the real biophilic deprivation, physical death and depredation of nature. Politically, Anthropocene lays bare some of the complex crossweaves of vulnerability and culpability that exist between us and other species as well as between humans now and humans to come. Conceptually, it warrants us to consider once again whether the modernization process is complete and the nature is gone for good, leaving nothing but us. Anthropocene has its origin in the earth sciences and advanced computational technologies. Its consequences have rippled across the global culture during the last 15 years. While producing a world of flawed representations, humankind is in danger of ignoring natural laws. These flawed representations of nature are particularly characteristic of modern consumer and service societies. McKenna stated that they are doing hard things, putting a price on what we don't want, that is pollution. So we get what we do want, that is innovation, lower emissions, phasing out coal, making sure we have cleaner fuels, 
making sure how we build is as energy efficient as possible. This approach of ecomodernism is an attempt to transcend some of the political polarization in current environment debates with a recognition that human ingenuity and technological innovation offer immense promise in tackling ecological challenges. The ecomodernist affirms the traditional environmentalist view that human societies should shrink their impact to leave more of Earth for nature, but rejects the idea that humans should attempt to harmonize with natural processes. Instead, they argue the goal should be increasingly to decouple human development from natural resource use and environmental impact. Thus, they aim at deepening and extending the mistakes of capitalists. Indeed, we have already entered the era of physical limits of the planet, but the capitalist economy, obsessed with the maximization of profits and capital, cannot conceive of anything else than the search for growth and exploitation of physical resources, resulting in denial of non-identity of nature. By violating its otherness and trying to turn it into malleable object, nature has been rebelling and showing signs of affliction. Especially, eco-capitalism not only, not only offers no guidance for revolutionary action, it advocates the capital-intensive tech fixes such as nuclear energy and carbon capture that the corporations would be delighted to have us spend trillions on. For example, BP, Shell, ExxonMobil, Exxon Chevron and Total spend a combined $200 million per year on lobbying designed to control, delay or blocking binding climate-motivated policy. Says a report by Influence Map, a non-profit research group. These five companies also spend $195 million annually on branding campaigns meant to portray them as energy transition champions even as they drastically increase spending on fossil fuel extraction. $200 million in lobbying plus $195 million in green greenwashing is more than enough to keep the system rigged. So in concerns to the second text uh, for our session, Richard Sennett highlights how organizations and capitalism has evolved since its time in the beginnings of industrialism. In the desire to free ourselves from the shackles we faced with bureaucracy and hierarchy uh, in earlier forms of capitalism, we created a more global and flexible and segmented organization with time. We believed that this flexible capitalism, which Senate calls it, would provide us uh, with greater freedom. However, this resulted uh, in unanticipated changes. These unintentional cultural and structural changes uh, have resulted in an economy of impermanence, which has shifted the mindset uh, of individuals, but also of society uh, and organizations, of course, um, to a short-term focus. So the author underlines three main changes, which is the loss of structure, the loss of institutional loyalty, and the diminished informal trust and weakening of institutional knowledge. So Senate really believes that our new fragmented flexible capitalism is actually or has actually created uh, an, econ an economy of impermanence, which has presented a great deal of uncertainty as individuals are consistently faced or constantly faced with uh, the impermanence of a constantly changing environment. So this has forced them to really focus on the short term um, as everything is, is so impermanent. So therefore, in the regards to our question, uh, Senate would say that faced with the fragmentation and the impermanence of our new flexible capitalism, the Canadian government has focused on short-term goals, um, such as maintaining the oil and gas industry strength, which this has been uh, an important piece of the Canadian economy for so many years. And, you know, it, it's, it should be mentioned also that... Uh, Governments make decisions in terms of being re-elected, um, making organizations happy, making people happy, and this is very much so uh, in their short-term objectives. Um, not to say that they haven't committed to long-term objectives in concerns to the environment, um, but they are very much prioritizing the short-term ones. 
So such segmentation has created the contradiction with the government's commitment to um, the reduced emissions, this commitment that they've made uh, in Paris 2030 and other green initiatives. The contradiction is due to the government's tendency to want to remain flexible and um, really focus on those short-term goals instead of focusing on the bigger picture through a long-term perspective by prioritizing the development of a more sustainable energy industry for the future um, of our environment and our economy both together. As um, we can agree that, or it is stated in the article, that these subsidies are slowing down that switch to a more sustainable and energy industry. So on similar lines, uh, Frémo focuses on individuals' relationships with their environment and goes further in trying to explain how we've gotten here uh, really through the human nature relationship. And maybe Frémo would explain more the basis of how we've uh, or why we've structured ourselves in such a way. Um, but Senate really provides an explanation in terms of uh, how we've decided to organize ourselves, how society functions, um, and how our economy functions since, you know, in reality we are a very economically centered society. Um, so to come back to the answer to the question, it's really um, in Senate's um, mindset, it's the inability to, you know, maintain maximum flexibility while pursuing um, long-term objectives that is the struggle for the government in this situation. And we can ask ourselves, will our future be increasingly limited um, by the decisions that we make today in our inability to commit to some form of permanence or a long-term objective? Will the fact that we can't commit to long-term objectives in terms of our environment, will that in the end end up being more constraining than actually committing to this objective right now? In regards to how we might explain the contradicting governmental actions and concerns to the economic policies on the one hand and the environment on the other, let's have a look at it from Adam Smith's perspective. Following Smith's line of thinking, the contradicting governmental actions in regard to the economic policies and the environment would be explained by the very will of the governments to intervene in the markets in the first place. In fact, in a Smithian framework, individuals are considered to be rational and markets are optimally functioning when they are self-regulating themselves. Government intervention and support in any shape or form should not come in interference with the functioning of the markets, either through subsidies or hindrance. In this scenario, natural harmony and equilibrium would be reached through the rational decision-making process of the customers. So what do we mean by that? The marketplace will be transparent. Consumers will be fully informed on the goods and services presented to them and they will rationally support those who encourage ecologically sane production methods as it is in their own interests. As a result, governments would not feel the need to support economic policies at the detriment of the environment, nor would they have to take measures against the environmental repercussions of those same policies. That leads us to a question. If applied in today's world, how would this vision of Adam Smith's work in practice? In a practical context, if markets were left to self-regulate, they would always lean towards the ultimate goal of generating profit because markets are just capitalistic institutions in nature. So as long as capitalists wish to earn money, they will continue to accumulate capital and put it to work 
to access energy and use it to transform resources that will then be brought to market for profit. So in a Smithian framework, ongoing energy use is therefore essential for economic growth. This trend will continue until we exhaust all of our natural resources or if fundamental change happens in the desire of the capitalist model to earn profit. Well, the latter is seeming not likely. What earth are we leaving for next generations? Now, let's have a look at the different assumptions and ethical implications of the answers proposed by our authors. For Fremo, the main assumption really is that the relationship between human and nature has been decisive for our survival and for shaping our living conditions. But not only that, it's been also crucial for our self-perception, for our own image and definition within the world. It means that the basic understanding of how we are anchored and located in the world or towards our immediate environment, such as our interactions, is translated into norms and values. The ecological challenge is rooted in human society itself, and the determinants are the basic values which are constantly reshaped by the self-perception of humans in and towards the environment. Ethically, thinking that managing and exploiting the planet so that humans can have good lives is not once, first of all, sustainable and not ethical. Things look rather different when we are confronted with, for example, business lobby groups that claim that economic growth should not be curtailed to protect the natural environment, that in other words, there are no natural limits that might act as a break on economic expansion. This results in destruction of nature so that humans can have their materialistic needs satisfied and enjoy what they deem to be good lives. For Senate, the assumption really is that hierarchy is a source of structure and social capital. What do we mean by that is that hierarchy is not all bad. It also has positive aspects to it. Let's name three of them. Hierarchy allows to work not only on the short term, but also on the long term, to have a long term vision of things. Secondly, it provides a sense of stability for the workers in an institution or even for the individuals in a society. And finally, hierarchy also gives a social gives social capital, which is a feeling of attachment to something, to a purpose, such as um, military and uh, soldiers in the army. The ethical um, implications uh, following that assumption is that we have to think short term versus long term. How can we ethically prioritize short term goals over long term goals or vice versa? In our case here, the answer might be obvious. We should prioritize long term environmental goals over our short term needs materialistic needs but for let's say um a third world country that is um in poor economic condition having short-term goals would be more needed they would be more in need of a short-term action than a long-term provision finally let's consider smith here, the assumption around Smith's um, answer is that markets are institutions that are self-regulating. No intervention should be 
should be happening especially from the government because they should simply be autonomous and regulating themselves basically in order to have optimal positive externalities they should function by themselves with no one interfering in the function in the functioning well um ethically speaking if we let mark if we were to leave market uh, follow their natural course and um lean toward that um, profit-centric mindsets the present generation profit-centric interests will not be environmentally sustainable for future generations we will be basically killing the earth to be extreme for our self and selfish needs if I may say if we may say however that is not sustainable and that is not ethical for the future generations to come in answering uh, our question the author that we found most relevant is senate um, in best explaining the reason for the contradicting governmental actions and concerns to the economic policies, which have been to provide uh, very significant, significant subsidies to the oil and gas industry, despite uh, the pledge to reduce um, CO2 emissions and uh, other green initiatives, which of course uh, are not supported through these subsidies. So Senate really provides an explanation to um, the prioritization of short-term political and economic motives. Um, and we truly believe that this is the most relevant uh, explanation. Although we don't discredit uh, Frémaux's explanation of the human uh, and natural relationship, which is truly at the source of the environmental issues, which we are faced with now, um, humans anthropocentrism and the view of nat of uh, nature as a commodity um, is definitely part of the problem the problem that we are facing however it does not uh, concretely provide an answer as to why um, despite its pledge to protecting the environment the government um, decides to act in a contradicting manner by continuously providing subsidies to an industry which is clearly hurting that long-term goal and is also slowing down the objective or which would be the ideal outcome is transitioning to a cleaner or more sustainable um, energy industry for the Canadian economy so Although Fremo makes very interesting points um, in regards to this, Fremo maybe touches more upon um, deeper issues than truly being able to explain how um, our institutions in power um, are, are, how is their relationship with the environment and why are we having such an issue um, with pushing these long-term objectives versus short-term ones. Um, and in concerns to Smith, um, Smith argues that human rationality and uh, self-regulating markets um, would really be able to take care of the issue single-handedly. Smith would say that government intervention is just probably the reason that we're having this problem and just government intervention should not be happening. Um, however, we can clearly see through current situations and everyday proof that human is definitely not or does not act rationally in our in their best interest in preserving the environment um, we very well know where many of our products come from how they've been made uh, we still choose to to buy them and support those organizations um, so we've decided that smith's answer is definitely not uh, as relevant or credible in thinking that um, government in intervention is just not at all required to uh, to protect the environment. Um, Senate also explains that there's a need 
for for a certain amount of, of hierarchy and structure in our ability to to handle issues whereas Prebo maybe answers more of how we should approach um, or how we should solve environmental issues Senate would really be able to explain the institutional and structural problems that we're having with the government really taking action.